Ignition sequence starts. Good morning and welcome to the view of Mission Control Houston. The Orbit 2 team of flight controllers is on console now for the latter portion of the crew workday on board the International Space Station. These are the men and women monitoring the station systems, standing by to respond if needed and help the astronauts and cosmonauts through their daily schedule of scientific research and station maintenance. Now, part of the routine during the orientation of any new space station crew members is to brief the newbies on where things are and how they work. Now, all of the space station crew members were fully trained on Earth, of course, but it's still a good idea to get an update on how things really work in space. And that includes, for example, and this is the most popular question asked of astronauts, how does the station's toilet work? By far the most common question we get asked as astronauts is how do you go to the bathroom in space? So, let's take a uh, a peek at the process. This compartment is called the WHC, a NASA acronym for Waste and Hygiene Compartment, I think. We just know it as WHC. It's inside this, uh, this we call the stall, which is a, uh, a couple of walls and a door that give you some privacy because you're right in the middle of node three with a treadmill on one side of the toilet, the weight machine we call A-RED, on the other side and down in the floor our awesome window called the cupola. And this is a high traffic area, people are coming and going, uh, so you need the privacy. First of all, the desire to go, the need to go, to go is very similar as on Earth. You just know you have to go. It doesn't feel any different because the fluid might be floating in your bladder or something. No, that's, it, it's just the exact same uh, sensation. You know you gotta go, either one, number one or number two. So you've already, you've decided that. You float into the WHC. And we have the toilet, which consists of a seat and a metal bucket that we call a keteo, which is a Russian acronym for something, container of something. And, uh, but it, it holds about, depending on how many people are here, it holds about um, maybe 30 deposits and we'll, uh, we'll talk about that in a second. The urine goes into this hose right here, and this valve is what activates the whole system. Okay, these are the two primary control panels for the WHC. When the system is ready for use, it's a V. This means it's going to the UPA. So we say, check that it's V to P. All right, now we're on the inside of the hygiene compartment. Close the door so that you have your privacy. You take the funnel. This knob right here activates the whole system. It's very, very uh, convenient because it's just one valve operates it all. But should the, in the event that you uh, forget how the system operates or you're brand new here and you just want to double check, in good NASA fashion, we have a checklist. This is called uh, Procedure 2.301, the no WHC Nominal Operations Cue Card. And it's got several blocks for operations. So there's two different ways that where the P can go. It can just go into a bucket, which is called a Yereve, and uh, essentially you're just peeing until that bucket's filled up, and then you have to swap out the bucket. Or you can configure WHC to UPA, and the urine processor assembly, and, uh, and that way the urine is going right in, directly into the system and that's where we normally keep it. Uh, and it's most convenient for the crew members because you're not constantly changing out a tank. So there's a couple blocks to tell you how to make those, those, those changes and, uh, and some detailed steps if you need to know how exactly to do it. And in case things go wrong with the hardware, not yourself, there's the WHC malfunctions cue card and we thought, thought of all the different light combinations in the failure modes and, and uh, 
But the bottom line is if there's a red light, we talk to the ground and together we, we figure out the path forward. Okay, back to normal operations. Time to go. You take the bow and uh, you turn it on. You hear the fan noise. Check for airflow. I'll show you that there is in fact airflow. So a little bit of airflow and that helps everything flow in the right direction. We've got our uh, simulator and that's where your business goes. You're complete. You want to be a good crew member, so you make sure that you wipe off the excess. Use a disinfectant wipe occasionally or often. And then you simply turn the valve off. But I want to show you number two as well. So I'll leave it running and we'll roll right into that. Okay, when it is time to go, you flip this lever here and that lifts up the lid. The seat here is about oh, five or six inches in diameter and there is a, a plastic liner in there which where your deposit goes. What I have here is green beans and mushrooms and I do not like mushrooms so I don't mind contributing this piece of uh, food in the name of education. So pretend I ate this yesterday and now it goes into there. You clean yourself and the wipes go into there as well. You take this red tab, you pull it off the rim and depends on how full the container is. This one's about halfway through. We do have a, a stick and you push it down in there with all its other friends and then it's time to put a new bag on. To put a new bag on, you separate, you pull that, it's like a hair scrunchie, and get it all so it has max capacity there, and ready to go. Close it up. Close the lid. Now you've gone number one. Number two, you cleaned yourself up, and uh, it's time to turn the system off. You just take this valve, rotate it to off, the fan spins down, the system checks itself, all the lights go out, and you're done. So congratulations, you've just used the WHC for the first time and you've learned about the process. Hope it's educational, but I don't think it's going to lessen the amount of times I have to answer that question. Thanks for watching. The food for the crew on the International Space Station is carefully chosen for its nutritional value and it's specially prepared and packaged to be easily accessible in a weightless world on orbit. Well, could the same food feed the needs of people who are stuck here on planet Earth? We conducted an experiment to find out how well two regular people could get by eating only astronaut food for a full week. Take a look at how they fared. always thought like oh my gosh when you go to space like you don't have to grocery shop for like six months I think it's gonna actually put me on a schedule for eating I am horrible at eating at all hours of the night I miss lunch uh, we're also talking about like beverages like we can probably only drink powdered beverages or water so nothing no sodas no sodas. nothing carbonated no. yeah no <laughs> just I think it'll be a little bit more healthy than what I normally eat plus I get to eat everything with tortillas and I'm from yeah. San Antonio so <laughs> I will say we are doing this over a holiday weekend. We have huge barbecues and yeah. lots of great food. So I think I I'm going to want to eat some really good ribs and, you know, like snacks. Solemnly swear to eat all of the astronaut food and not cheat. <laughs>
Never. Never. We're in this together, so if we feel Never, weak, ever, ever. We'll text each other, maybe this. <laughs> we chose seven days out of the standard menu. You're gonna have uh, a protein, some carb, some fruit. The other large category of products that we have are thermostabilized products. Which is a, sort of like a military ration that we don't have to uh, refrigerate uh, to keep fresh. Can't do them in a microwave. I was gonna say, they got it looks like something that can't go in a microwave, but I was gonna ask because I didn't want to find that out the hard way. Yeah. Um, we also have rehydratable food, which is this type in a vacuum pack where we have to add water, either hot or cold. We're going to give you a syringe. Oh, I don't um, like needles. And, and it comes with a needle. So this is you how you would rehydrate, too. okay? I don't think we would want to have that laying around our office. Can I anyway. take that to airport security? Yeah. <laughs> It is the day before we start the food challenge, and I just went to go pick up all the materials from our wonderful food lab. So they're all packaged and in my trunk. I asked them what I should eat as my last uh, real meal, and they said something fresh, maybe a salad. The problem is I was thinking nachos, so. As I suspected, I wouldn't have time to eat in the airport. I'm probably going to grab something to eat on the fly. Hopefully there's some tacos. So like I said, I was debating healthy or, uh, you know, not healthy. Of course, uh, I chose nachos. I did end up picking up some tacos, some shrimp tacos actually, with some rice and some beans. Um, I told you I love tacos. I think it's important to always choose nachos, so I'm gonna call this hashtag she chose nachos. She chose nachos, he chose tacos. So I have beef and mushrooms, rice pilaf, tomato and artichokes, and a wheat flatbread. Well, I don't know about that. <laughs> I have grilled chicken, mac and cheese, vegetarian chili. We're in Texas, come on. <laughs> Cran apple dessert. Oh man, I already, remember she told us to tear it so there's no extra pieces of trash. Oh, so like if we were in space, so this like would this. all be floating around. Yeah. Everywhere. Once we open those packages, the food is what we consider to be liberated and it can just float anywhere. And sometimes you find yourself using your spoon or your mouth to, to chase around the food and make sure you get it all in your mouth instead of stuck against the wall or somebody's face. Let's heat up a bowl of water and set these green That's ones in there. Idea. Yeah. like it's getting to be the right consistency. Yeah. yeah. We might have not done hot enough water too. That might be why it's not absorbing like all the way. Okay, oh, okay. Well, this is good. <laughs> this is interesting. <laughs> it's not bad. Wait a minute, what was this? This, oh, this is, good. is good. Yeah, the artichokes and tomatoes mm -hmm. are good too. Should I try and eat it like this? Yeah. Ooh. You should have just got straws. I could have been like. Right. <laughs> This is making my day. Like, this is a treat. I have cran apple dessert. This would remind me of home. Yum. So it's been a long day, but I did not get hungry at all. I had my butterscotch pudding as part one of my snack. I was wondering if the workouts would be hard. They're pretty much the same. I feel really high energy and I didn't even have coffee this morning. I'm actually really excited about this chicken corn and bean. This potato medley actually looks like some potatoes with spices and melted cheese on it. I'm very excited to get some melted cheese texture up in here. Little butter cookies look really delicious and super bougie. So you'll see I have um, some Caribbean chicken, pesto pasta with some corn, tortillas, vanilla pudding, and some pears. It got a little bit better at actually making the space food today, but I punctured the, the actual corn. I cut through it, so I had to rehydrate it through the side. Um, so lesson learned. This smells absolutely delicious. It's my boyfriend's last day at his old job, so one of his favorite clients brought him these delicious, huge-looking cupcakes, so none for me. <laughs> Do you see that? This is science, y'all. So you a nurse now. I get <laughs> My mom would be proud. Like, mom, I'm doing nurse things today. <laughs> Look at this. Oh, okay. This looks like oatmeal. Do PR for NASA, they said. It'd be fun. <laughs>
What are you having for lunch? What's your, your main? I have citrus salad, and then my main thing is fiesta chicken. Ooh, I love fiesta. Yeah, and rice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, rice with butter. And so tacos. I'm really excited because I think our food's going to be warmer today. I, I agree. I think we did this right with some practice yesterday. <laughs> This is some smoked turkey. Ooh, oh my God. <laughs> it's leaking. <laughs> I wasn't expecting it. Like... It smells funky. <laughs> some cornbread dressing. And then some cauliflower. I'm not a fan of this. Um, Today we're eating in the LBJ room. So President LBJ um, is who Johnson's Space Center is named after. We should do a toast. To we President should. Johnson. Go LBJ. Woo! Woo. <laughs> Oh, mine's closed. <laughs> and so here we go. Mmm, this is really good. This is the, the chicken noodles. Let's try some of this green bean. Oh, that could use some hot sauce. The lentil soup. Ooh, it's hot. Ooh, hot. See, um, these are actually my tortillas. Astronauts on board the International Space Station can actually eat tortillas. And it's one of the things that they like to do because you can pretty much grab anything that's floating in space with them. Two quick miscellaneous notes. I've been living a really scheduled life and waking up early and going to bed early because I've been having to wake up with enough time to make breakfast. And then I go to bed shortly after dinner just so I don't get hungry again. I think Dan has a burrito. <laughs> oh I yeah. I am jealous right now. I went for pink. And queso. Oh, cool. Apples, Apples, fresh fruit. Which may or may not be organic. My <laughs> snack was chicken in a pouch, so. <laughs> Mine was tuna in yeah. a pouch. <laughs> there you go. Lemon curry cake. Oh, it's kind of like your rice. <laughs> <laughs> Not your grandma's name. <laughs> <laughs> I was just at the mall and whew, that was a weak time because all of my friends I got some really good appetizers and when you're just all sitting around the table together, it's, I had to really stop myself a couple times to not mindlessly uh, reach for some of their chips or pretzels. What are you eating? Um, a cupcake. And what is Isidro eating? Space chocolate. Space chocolate. Yeah. How do you feel about the astronaut candy? Can you tell which one is the space food and which one is our regular Easter meal here? Hey guys, what are y'all making? Astronaut burgers. My family gets to eat this delicious grilled food and I get to eat a kind of brisket, a space brisket and baked barbecue beans. So we'll see how that ends up being. <laughs> see this? Oh, it's coming apart. Oh no! no. Oh, Save the beans! It's Monday, so we're done at Wednesday morning. We're really ready to be done. The weekend was hard. I was not able to eat any of the food that I was at the festival. Um, I, there were some jalapeno corn dogs, and I'm like, this one's so good. what is life right, right now? now? I can't even. <laughs> and we have curry chicken, green beans, and potatoes. The potatoes have been iffy, but these look better than some of the ones. Mm -hmm. Cream of mushroom soup. Oh. A little bit of India, a little bit of Texas with this countryness. I'm so ready for this to be over. Yeah, we're ready. We're I need my social life back. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm right. just. I'm having milk today. Powdered milk. Ah! We're nervous about the I'm more nervous about the milk, I'm not gonna lie. Um, but something that I noticed while we've been eating this food is you have to have it really hot. On the space station, we put it in a kind of a, it's almost like an easy bake oven. Okay. Where you just, okay. and that does make a really big difference. So, <laughs> I gotta admit, when I was making lunch this morning, I wasn't thinking this was gonna be on camera. <laughs> Leftover rice, some turkey. Some, but it's uh, home cooked. It's definitely home cooked. <laughs> yeah, I was a big fan of the garlic paste. Garlic paste. That could fix anything. Okay, question. Can you chew gum in space? Yes. Okay, because okay. garlic, you know, bad breath. <laughs> uh, I wasn't trying to impress any of my crew members. <laughs> we would use what we call food glue. Something, oh, we'll just make, <laughs> make up something. Spray some olive oil in there to try to get everything to stick together a little bit. Yes. Or like I said, the garlic paste worked well for me. <laughs> what? When you get a few people with rice in their eye, then after that, you figure something out. <laughs> You know, it's a lot easier in space because we don't have to load the syringe. Like if you were trying to measure out 250 milliliters of water or 100 milliliters of water, we literally just dial that number mm. and then press the button for hot or cold water. Mm. So talk to me about tacos in space. Tortillas, are they great to have up there? Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it just floated on this plate. <laughs>
Gosh, if we had salsa, we did have salsa sometimes. You could put that on there. The salsa will stick to the bread. You can use the salsa for other things to stick to the salsa. I'm from San Antonio, and I love tacos. So I told everyone I would make a space taco. taco. Yeah. So it's a little bit leaky, extra it moist. Have it, in space. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't drip off the edges, it just makes a bubble. Gotta do the taco tilt because <laughs> everybody knows. <laughs> oh. <laughs> this is good stuff. That's awesome. This was the Mexican scrambled eggs food lab. They know what they're doing. We have some scientists back there. So is there anything that you... Ooh, we did it! Way better than the LBJ toast. Yeah. <laughs> Favorite meal, I actually really liked a lot of the breakfast food. Um, and the shrimp cocktail was, in fact, very good. Ooh, shrimp cocktail. But the scrambled eggs in a taco? <laughs> Ugh, man. Sorry. <laughs> Done. And maybe if I had a machine to kind of heat everything up. If I was sealed away from the outside world and I didn't have all those temptations, <laughs> maybe. Maybe if the food was floating around me, but I don't think I would otherwise. We maybe could do that. if I were an astronaut. <laughs> so I was debating, uh, this is the same debate I started with, <laughs> nachos or a salad. Let's get them both. Yeah, I'll get both. Yeah, I, I mean, should get listen, both. listen, at this point, yeah. I think we need to treat ourselves. Oh, for sure. But I can tell you, I really want some coffee. Yeah. <laughs> some nice, Regular coffee. hot coffee. Like a latte. I, I, I gotta get some coffee. And a soda. Yeah. <laughs> this is not easy, y'all. I'm telling you. Along with work on science experiments, astronauts on the International Space Station spend some of their time sharing the experience of being in space with kids on the ground. In 2017, astronaut Joe Acaba made the first ever educational ham radio contact with a school in Venezuela, courtesy of the Amateur Radio on International Space Station program. Think those kids were excited talking to someone in space? Well, they were not the only ones. Para nosotros poder establecer la comunicación debemos ver a la estación espacial y ella debe vernos o nuestras antenas se deben ver. Entonces tenemos que superar las montañas que nos rodean. ¿Por qué? Porque indudablemente si hubiera sido en inglés pues también tiene un impacto, pero no es el mismo impacto que se lleva a los muchachos. Astronauts and cosmonauts on the International Space Station also get the benefit of being able to look out the window at a view of Earth that only a few hundred people have ever seen firsthand. For former astronaut Alvin Drew, that sight was a reminder that we need to keep pushing the boundaries of exploration. How is the quality of the TV? Oh, it's beautiful, Mike. It really is. I'm in first grade and I'm watching uh, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin dancing around like every other kid who's you know, out there watching this. They want to go do this. This is the coolest thing ever. And I remember asking my dad, what kind of job do I need to have growing up that I can make enough money that I can go fly to the moon? And he goes, well, there's a job out there called being an astronaut. And if you are that, they will pay you to go to the moon. They're going to pay me to go to the moon. Like, yeah, like, that's it. I've made my career decision. I'm going to go be an astronaut. I did not think the experience of spaceflight would change me. And I hear about these people going and having this overview effect and they come back and like, There's, what am I gonna go experience out there that's going to change who I am? 
but it made me think about a lot of things. Uh, and so for the first part, uh, we all had that part where you, you're, you're seeing the earth and you see yourself next to the earth and you feel very tiny next to the earth. Then you turn the other way and the earth seems very tiny compared to the cosmos out there. And so you feel like you're two orders of magnitude down in terms of you know the size of things out there. All of life, all of the history of life, all of your life and everybody you know is in this little tiny membrane of air that sits on top of this planet. And beyond that membrane of air is this abyss of space. It's just, you know, there's, there's, there's nothing life-giving about it. And that's it, that's all that separates you. And, and, and it makes you feel like we're in a very tiny spot out here. As big as the Earth seems, it, it, it seems suddenly very, very finite. One of the things that, that, that got me one day, we had, we had some time off and I, I wanted to go get some pictures of items that I'd flown up for other, other people out there. And so I'd get out there and I, I'd crank open all the different panels on the cupola window. And just by dumb luck, we were flying down the spine of New Zealand. So you've got this emerald green island with all the, the, the mountains and you've got the ocean out there as the backdrop for all these photos. And it almost made me forget to take the pictures because I was too busy gawking at, at New Zealand. Uh, out, out of the cupola as we went over it. Going on my very first spacewalk, I looked down, and that was my first mistake because this was the Amazon rainforest beneath me. Um, it's February, I guess it's summertime in the Southern Hemisphere, so I could see all the way down to the, to the river itself and all the, the, the dark green lush jungles, the brown river and all the estuaries flowing into it. I can see this muddy delta going out into the Atlantic Ocean and I can see the gray and snow-capped peaks of the Andes Mountains all out to the west. And so despite my best intentions, Mother Nature was saying, you will not ignore me, you must pay attention. And I'm just sitting there just gobsmacked looking at this thing and trying hard to tear myself away. Fortunately, my lead spacewalker, Steve, he just sat there and said, just take your time and take the scene and you will never see something like this again ever. So you might as well get the experience now. My advice for humanity is this is a great place to start, but don't stick around here very long. We have opportunities out there. I forget who it was who said, if humankind was meant to explore the universe, God would have given us a moon. We need to take advantage of that, um, use that as a, as, a, as a leaping pad to get off into other places. Someday we're gonna need to be from space and not going out there, simply going into it. If you want another look at any of the stories you saw today, you can always find them on YouTube and Facebook, where you'll also find lots of other great features on a wide variety of NASA topics. If you're looking for good conversation about human spaceflight, check out Houston We Have a Podcast, our weekly show talking to folks involved in all areas of space exploration. Today, Gary Jordan explores the strange world of orbital debris that circles our planet, and learns how the people flying missions in Earth orbit work to avoid taking any major hits. Go to nasa.gov slash podcast for this week's episode, right next to all the previous episodes, and the full library of all the NASA podcasts, which are also on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and SoundCloud.